and welcome to Once Upon a Time, our library television show hosted by the kind and wonderful Pocatello Community Media. Um, I'm Catherine Poulter and here is Becca Hyde. Good morning. Good morning. We have some stories for you. I have some fanciful ones about imaginary creatures and other countries and this earth too. I think you'll like it. And the first story I have is Dragon Was Terrible. <laughs> it's by Kelly DiPuccio and the pictures are by Greg Pizzoli. Here we go. There is Dragon. He is terrible. Dragon was terrible. Naturally, dragons have a bit of terrible in them because they're dragons after all. But this dragon here, super terrible. He stomped on flowers. He played tricks on the guards. And he spit on cupcakes. Who does that? Dragon, that's who. That's not all. He scribbled in books. He threw sand. And he took candy from baby unicorns. Honestly, that's terrible. The king had had enough. Enough, he said. And he posted this sign. Brave knights, whoever shall tame the terrible dragon shall be rewarded with a gift. It shall be a nice gift. Ye shall like it. Signed, His Royal Majesty, the King. And look, the dragon has done some graffiti. It says, dragon was here. <laughs> Knights lined up to show off their dragon taming skills. They all failed miserably. And dragon just grew more terrible. He chased fuzzy yellow ducklings around the moat. He TP'd the castle. And he burned every last royal marshmallow to a blackened crisp. The villagers had had enough. Enough, they said, and they changed the sign a little bit. Brave people, it now said. Whoever shall tame the terrible dragon shall be rewarded with a gift from the king. It shall be a nice gift, we hope. Ye shall like it, perhaps. And look, the dragon has already been there to do more graffiti. Dragon was here again. Ordinary blokes and lassies lined up to try their hand at taming the dragon. They all failed, embarrassingly so. And just when you thought it wasn't possible, dragon grew even more terrible. He popped birthday balloons. He drew funny faces on the drawbridge. And he burped in church loudly, honestly. That's terrible and rude. A boy wearing a feathered cap and a look of determination had had enough. Only he didn't say enough like you thought he would. Instead, he went to work sketching a story. The next morning, Dragon followed a trail of marshmallows to a shady tree where the boy was reading. The boy spied the dragon out of the corner of his eye and began to read in a loud, booming voice. And then the brave dragon swooped in to save the princess, he said. Dragon stopped in his tracks. But the terrible knight pulled out his wicked sword. Dragon pretended not to listen. The brave dragon roared, and the frady cat knight trembled in his boots. Dragon pretended to walk away. A crowd began to gather and Dragon took cover in a tree. The boy continued reading page after page after page until... Snap! Crash! Dragon landed on the ground with a terrible thud. The crowd gasped. The dragon roared. But the clever boy didn't flinch. He reached out a hand to the dragon and said, Would you like to hear the rest of the story? And just when you thought it wasn't possible, Dragon smiled. And he took a seat beneath the tree with the other children. Honestly, that's adorable. 
The king cheered, the villagers cheered, the baby unicorn and fuzzy ducklings <laughs> cheered, the loudest of all. At long last, the terrible dragon had been tamed. The end. Hey, wait, what about the reward? Oh, yeah, that. The gift was a new friend, a nice dragon, of course. <laughs> the end. <laughs> I, <laughs> <love that book. laughs> I do, too. Well, it seems like this is the season, perfect season, to make an apple pie. True. And if you don't have apples still on your tree, you could get them at the farmer's market. That's right. Good. So here we have how to make an apple pie and see the world. And it's by Marjorie Priceman. Making an apple pie is really very easy. You need apples, flour, sugar, cinnamon, salt, butter, and egg. First, get all the ingredients at the market. Mix them well, bake them, and serve. Unless, of course, the market is closed. Gone fishing. In that case, go home and pack a suitcase. Take your shopping list and some walking shoes. Then catch a steamship bound for Europe. Use the six days on board to brush up on your Italian. If you time it right, you'll arrive in Italy at harvest time. Find a farm deep in the countryside. Gather some superb semolina wheat. An armful or two will do. Then hop a train to France and locate a chicken. French chickens lay elegant eggs and you want only the finest ingredients for your pie. Coax the chicken <laughs> to give you an egg. Better yet, bring the chicken with you. There's <laughs> less chance of breaking the egg that way. <laughs> Get to Sri Lanka any way you can. <laughs> Hitch a ride to England. Make the acquaintance of a cow. You'll know she's an English cow from her good manners and charming accent. And if you can borrow a cup, ask if you can borrow a cup or two of milk. Even better, bring the, the whole cow with you for the freshest possible results. And if you're in Sri Lanka, you can't miss it because Sri Lanka is a pear-shaped island in the Indian Ocean. The best cinnamon in the world is made there from the bark of the native Kurundu trees. So go directly to the rainforest, find a Kurundu tree and peel off some bark. If a leopard is napping beneath the tree, be very quiet. Stow away on a banana boat headed home to Jamaica. On your way there, you can pick up some salt. Fill a jar with salty seawater. And when the boat docks in Jamaica, walk to the nearest sugar plantation. Introduce yourself to everyone. Tell them about the pie you're making. Then go into the fields and cut a few stalks of sugar cane. <laughs> Better fly home. You don't want the ingredients to spoil. Wait a minute. Aren't you forgetting something? What about the apples? Have the pilot drop you off in Vermont. <laughs> You won't have to go far to find an apple orchard. Pick eight rosy apples from the top of the tree. Give one to the chicken, one to the cow, and eat one yourself. That leaves five for the pie. Then hurry home. Now all you have to do is mill the flour, the wheat into flour. Grind the kurundu bark into cinnamon. Evaporate the salt water from the salt. Boil the sugar cane. Persuade the chicken to lay an egg. Milk the cow. Churn the milk into butter. Slice the apples, mix the ingredients, and bake the pie. While the pie is cooking, invite some friends over to share it with you. Remember that apple pie is delicious topped with vanilla ice cream, which you can get at the market. But if, if the market happens to be closed, Still fishing, it says. You can eat it plain. The end. And there's the recipe. Which? Oh, that is, is delicious. Good. That makes me want to have some apple pie. <laughs> <laughs>
I have another story here. This is a story of traveling also, mm -hmm. but it's not always the people who drew the traveling. It's some little shards, a little, a single pebble. This is called A Single Pebble, A Story of the Silk Road. It's by Bonnie Christensen. And this is the map from China all the way over to um, Italy and back again. And there's the little girl who found a pebble in the stream. Here we go. Spring, the sun rose. May buzzed around her father, begging to travel to the market with him. It's my job to trade our silk, he said. It's your job to stay home and care for the silkworms. May turned a jade pebble in her hand. Her father brought fantastic stories from home from his travels, stories of monks and merchants, acrobats, pilot, pirates, and thieves, those who traveled the long road between east and west. May longed to meet them all, to gather stories of her own. At least my pebble can go, she said. A pebble for a child at the end of the road. But it's only a pebble, her father laughed. No, May answered. It's cool like the stream water where I found it, and green like the moss and smooth like the water. May's father smiled. But I don't travel to the end of the road. You'll find a way, May said. Everything is possible. And if a single pebble can travel to the end of the road, so can I. Summer in Turfan. May's father turned the jade pebble in his hand. He'd sold his silk and bought a tiny square of blue glass that came from the west end of the road, thousands of miles away, a gift for May. A Buddhist monk wandered by. Why such a frown, he asked. This single pebble, my daughter wants to send it west to a child at the end of the road, but I must return home. I travel west to Kashgar, the monk said. I'll see that pebble continues on. Please, May father, May's father said, say it's a gift from a girl in the land where the sun rises. Now it's autumn in Kashgar. The monk played his flute in the marketplace. Soldiers, traders, and pilgrims stopped a moment to listen. Only one young man, a sandalwood trader, lingered. Later, the two shared food while the monk told the story of the pebble. But now I travel south, the monk said. The sandalwood trader grinned. I'm going west. I'll take these, the monk said, the pebble and a flute, gifts from a girl in the land where the sun rises. The sandalwood trader placed the gifts in his finest box to travel west. Now it's spring in Samarkand. Music and laughter rang from a far corner of the bazaar where the sandalwood trader found a family performing acrobatics. When the music stopped, only the sandalwood trader stayed to drop a coin in the payment bowl. Instantly, Lala, the youngest daughter, began dancing. The sandalwood trader tried to dance too, but the box in his belt kept slipping. When the box fell open, Lala's eyes widened. These treasures aren't mine, the sandalwood trader explained and told the story. And now I must return to India. We'll carry the wet gifts west to Baghdad, Lala's father cried. To Baghdad, the family cheered. From a girl in the land where the sun rises, the sandalwood trader said. And now it's summer in Baghdad. The crowds in Baghdad cheered and made generous donations. One night, after the crowd dispersed, Lala found a tiny carved elephant among the coins. For the box, she said. 
Lovely, a stranger's voice startled them all. A gift for a child at the west end of the road, Lala said. Ah, the stranger's eyes glimmered. I'm traveling west myself. Excellent, you can carry the treasure on, Lala's father declared. It's a gift for a child, Lala glared at the stranger, from a girl in the land where the sun rises, and you must contribute. The man offered a single stick of cinnamon. I'm but a poor traveler, he growled. Reluctantly, Lala released the box. Winter in Antioch. The stranger collected goods along the road to Antioch, where he boarded a ship to Italy. One black night, his dreams were shattered by the cry of pirates. The stranger scrambled to hide his satchel, but a pirate grabbed it first. Thief! the stranger shouted. The pirate, who knew a true thief when he saw one, laughed. Just leave me the box, the stranger begged. It's a gift from a girl in the land where the sun rises. A gift for a child. So it is, the pirate laughed and disappeared into the night. Spring in Torcello. The pirate ship glided into its hiding place in the lagoon. Only one pirate stayed on the island. As he passed the church, tiny shards of blue glass, lost from the church's construction, glinted in the sun. Papa! a boy yelled from down the road. Tommaso! the pirate cried. Did you bring me anything? asked Tommaso. Just a box. Tommaso's eyes widened. He inhaled the sandalwood's perfume, tasted the cinnamon, admired the carved elephant, and tried a note on the flute. At last he found the pebble. Ah, the best of all. But it's only a pebble, his father laughed. No, Tommaso said, it's cool like the breeze and green like seaweed and smooth like the water. From a girl in the land where the sun rises, the pirate said. Tommaso smiled, turned the pebble in his hand and raised his face to the warmth of the sun. And it's spring now near Chang'an, 4,000 miles away. May felt the spring sun on her face. She turned a tiny square of blue glass in her hand and recalled her father's words. You're strong and clever, May. It's not impossible that you may travel to the west end of the road, to the land where this glass began its journey. Not impossible, May smiled. If a tiny square of glass can travel to the end of the road, so can I. And here, is the end of the whole road again from Torcello where the glass began to all the way over to China where May lived. The end. Oh that was a beautiful story. I love that and it fit very well with your apple pie story. And just wait here's another story about journeys. <coughs> oh nice. The journey of <coughs> monarchs from Canada to Mexico. Oh nice. And here. Here it shows the path through the United States, mm. ending at the western, northwestern Mexico. This is a beautiful book. It's called Curry <coughs> and the Monarch, and it's written by Antoine O'Flarta and illustrated by Milo So. Nice. <laughs> Here is Hurry the Tortoise. Hurry the Texas Tortoise is starting to think about winter when out of the bright October sky, a monarch butterfly lands on his back. What do you call this place? asked the monarch. Wichita Falls, says Hurry, and that's my back you're standing on. Wichita Falls, not far enough, says the monarch. Not far enough for what? asks Hurry. For staying, replies the monarch. With that, the monarch opens her wings and flies off, hurries back. I level with hurry now, the monarch seems fascinated with the old tortoise. How long have you been here? asks the monarch. Seems like forever, says hurry. Maybe one day you'll break out of that shell, grow wings and fly away, says the monarch. I doubt it, says hurry. 
It happened to me, replies the monarch, thinking about that extraordinary morning when, the f when she first opened her wings. Where did that happen, asked Hurry. Far away in a place called Canada, in a garden just like this. Why did you leave, asked Hurry. The days got colder, says the monarch. What do you do when the days get colder? Sleep, answers Hurry. Cold days always change back into warm days, if you wait. I don't have time for that, says the monarch, flying away from the garden. She joins more monarchs. They turn the sky orange as they continue their journey south toward the sweet water. Back in the garden, a cloud passes over the sun and Hurry shuts his eyes as the old tortoise begins to dream. The monarch travels on, resting at night in places you would expect to see a butterfly rest, and sometimes in places you would not. Hmm, barbed wire fence. Each new day brings new sights. Sometimes a day brings danger, but the monarch survives, flying now toward Eagle Pass, then over the waters of the Rio Grande into Mexico. On and on, she flies until finally, one November evening, she finds it the warm green forest she has been searching for. She hangs from a bough, adding her tired wings to the soft murmur of a million others. The monarch in flight for winter knows she's found the perfect place. Spring returns to Hurry's garden. He slowly opens his eyes and feels the warmth of the sun. Never fails, thinks Hurry. Then one morning, the monarch also returns. So where are you going now, asks Hurry. Back to the beginning, answers the monarch. Do you mean Canada, asks Hurry. Possibly, says the monarch. Butterflies can be infuriatingly mis mysterious, thinks Hurry, watching the monarch lay eggs on a milkweed plant. Then she flies away. Mm -hmm. In the town of Stillwater, she flies in through an open window and thinks it might be nice to rest her worn wings for a while in the folds of a sun-colored curtain. For a while becomes forever. Mm. Back in the garden, over by the milkweed plant, Hurry sees a newborn caterpillar. Hello, says Hurry, but the caterpillar doesn't answer. He is too busy eating the milkweed leaves. Hurry watches and waits as the caterpillar grows, shedding skin after skin, then crawling away to hide under a twig. But this garden is Hurry's whole world, and there is little in it that is hidden from him. In the weeks that follow, Hurry sees an amazing transformation happen right in front of his still and patient eyes. A new monarch emerges from the shell, wet and wrinkled. For a while, he clings to his empty shell, waiting for his wings to expand and dry in the warm sunshine. And after a few hours, the monarch spreads his strong new wings and flies toward Hurry, landing on his back. What do you call this place? asked the monarch. Here we go again, says Hurry, as the monarch opens his wings and flies off Hurry's back. What's your hurry? asks Hurry. I'm off to see the world. What do you think it's like? asks the butterfly. I imagine, says Hurry, slowly, I imagine that it's like my garden, mm -hmm. a place full of astonishing things. I can't wait, says the young monarch, flying away. The end. Oh, that's beautiful. I like that story. Me too. I would love to see that happen. I would too. That, that would migration. be so beautiful. Well, we had here, not so many mm. years ago, the painted lady butterflies everywhere, all over everything. I and remember what color? those. The, the yellow? Kind of brownish. Brownish. Okay. And they have some orange on them. Okay. 
and they were everywhere <laughs> in the street on the houses everywhere and then they flew away that was it yes um i have a book here it's also kind of about a journey it's mm -hmm. called the three golden keys it's by peter cease and i think his beautiful illustrations are some of my favorites anywhere this is about this book is written oh and this is a beautiful plaster wall this book is written for Peter's daughter. She was just a little baby when he wrote it, and he is telling about going back to his native land of Prague in what was then Czechoslovakia. And now is, and he escaped there during the Second World War with his family. And now this is a story of a fanciful journey that he took. This is called The Three Golden Keys by Peter Cease. And here's the letter of introduction to his daughter. And here we go. His daughter's name is Madeline, and this book is for her. And it says, Madeline, a wild and turbulent storm took control of my hot air balloon and sent me far off course. When the storm finally calmed, I found myself floating toward the spires of a big city. I did not have time to wonder about the city as my balloon was rapidly losing air. I was lucky to land unharmed on a deserted square. I quickly got out of the gondola. There was nobody anywhere, but all of a sudden, Everything around me reminded me of my childhood. Could it be that the storm had taken me all the way back to Prague, where I grew up? Would I still remember the way through the twisting streets to my family's house? And look at all of this map, all of those twisting streets. Wow. Our family home. Here it was still with all of its memories. Is anybody home? There are three rusty padlocks on the door. Three padlocks I have no keys to. I have to get the keys, but there is nobody around. Then out of nowhere comes our black cat. Can it really be my cat after all these years? Somehow I know she wants me to follow her. I follow my cat through the winter streets of my childhood. All those games, sledding on the first snow with the tips of my ears freezing, tea with lemon, the stove in the dark, two eyes of fire. The cat waits for me as I wander to the empty street filled with December memories. My sister's birthday, St. Nicholas with his angel and his devil. President for the presents for the good children and coal for the bad. Christmas time with carp in the bathtub, family visits, and a magical tree. I follow my cat for a long time. Every house, every window, every cobblestone brings back some memory. The signs on the old buildings tell of good times and bad. We are heading toward the castle. Before we reach the castle, the, ki the cat turns to the library, another place I loved to visit as a child. The door is open and everything is, a is as it used to be. The library is deserted and quiet. There's a shift in the wall of books ahead of me. The librarian magically emerges from the wall. I have seen him before in some old painting. He moves toward me, holding a scroll. Other characters emerge from the rows of books, silently and majestically. The librarian unrolls the scroll. There is a golden key attached to it. He gives it to me. And on the scroll, 
I read this story. It is a story from my childhood. When I finish the story, I am alone and holding the key. And here's the story, the story of the knight Brunswick, who was trapped on a desert island. And he knew that there was no way to escape, so he disguised himself by hiding under one of the horses. And when a huge bird came to take the horse to feed to its babies, he clung to the horse and he was flown off of the island. Then he met a lion who was fighting a dragon and the lion was losing. So Brunswick took out his sword and killed the dragon and saved the lion. And the lion after that was his good friend and companion for all the rest of his life. And then they went to Prague where Brunswick married a beautiful girl, and they lived happily ever after. When I stumble out of the library, the cat is waiting to lead me on. The city seems different, but still empty. Following the cat, I am thinking of those childhood summers in the old town, hide and seek, marbles and the cool air you could feel coming out of the ancient cellars. Summertime in the city, playing games till late at night, but piano lessons too. Can I hear sounds of music from the open windows? Slices of fresh baked bread with the ripe tomatoes. The cat is waiting again. I reached the entrance to a garden. Didn't we come here as boys on one of our expeditions? The cat is hiding in the bushes, whipping her tail. Then the plants begin to grow and expand, flowers and fruit, shapes and forms. The emperor appears. Everything is deathly silent. The garden has turned into the emperor's court. The emperor himself is opening a scroll with another golden key. He gives it to me. And here I read the story on the ancient paper. It is another tale of my childhood. At the end, I am alone with two keys in my hand. And this is the tale of the golem. Rabbi Lev looked at the plight of the Jewish people who were living in the ghetto, and he knew that he must do something to help them. They were so hungry. So he built a golem. And in it, he put a rock with the name of God on it. And the golem would do everything he could to help the Jewish people. One day, Rabbi Lev forgot to take the stone out of, his, out of the golem's head on a, Saturday, on a Friday night. It was almost the Sabbath. And the little boy who saw the golem thought, oh, I can have some porridge while everyone else is in the synagogue. So he said to the golem, Please make some porridge for me. And the golem began to make porridge. And he made porridge and he made porridge. And pretty soon the porridge began to float out of the windows and out of the doors. And everything was covered with porridge. It was almost the Sabbath. One more verse of reading and it would have been the Sabbath. And the, ma and the rabbi would not have been able to stop the golem. But he saw the porridge and he stopped in the middle of a verse and ran over and took out the stone. And the golem stopped making porridge. And the people had porridge for a very long mm -hmm. time. I run to catch up with the cat. The streets seem different again. Now they remind me of autumn winds, the smell of apples, gas lamps, lighters with their long tapers, the frozen dew. We crossed the bridges. Still no one anywhere. Memories are flying kites, disappearing in the fog, making little people out of chestnuts, steaming horses pulling the mail carts, getting up in the dark for school. The cat is rushing ahead. We arrive at the town square with its famous clock and its 27 crosses paved into the sidewalk to commemorate the nobleman executed here a long, long time ago. The door to the clock tower is open. I follow the cat inside. We find ourselves in a strange dome 
filled with a strange collection of things. Everything is quietly shimmering, motionless, as if frozen in time. Out of the woodwork come strange mythical robots. The leader is a mechanical baron, and he brings me another scroll. Here is the third golden key. I take it. I read yet another story from my childhood, and at the end, I am all alone, with all three golden keys in my hand. And this is the story of Hanus, who was the best clockmaker anywhere. And for Prague, he made the most beautiful and most magnificent clock anyone had ever heard of. It has 12 apostles that come out every hour on the hour and enact a play. It has all sorts of interesting mechanical pieces. Everybody loved the clock, except the town fathers. They liked the clock, but they were afraid that Hanos would build another better clock for another city. So one night, in the dead of night, they went over to Hanos' house and blinded him so he could never work on another clock again. Hanos didn't come out of his house for many, many, many days. And finally, when his door opened, out came not Hanos, but a mechanical creature with eyes shining brightly, mechanically, that could look into people's souls and see all of the good and all of the bad that they did. The robot walked across the town square, up into the clock tower, and perched on the very top where his eyes shine out now, looking to see all the good and all of the bad of all of the people. With the three golden keys in my hand, the ancient city seems filled with springtime. The old town square clock is silently waving goodbye. The face of the clock smiles and wishes me well. I think of when we were children and we used to wait for the march of the apostles to the clock as the ch clock chimed each hour and the skeleton rang the bell. I follow the determined cat back across the ancient bridges. We seem to sail through the clouds of the river. I remember the beautiful spring, the first fresh leaves, Easter eggs, cake in the shape of a lamb, the maple and a blue, blue sky. I feel as though many others have joined me and Many will be walking forever after in different times, different ages, like time travelers in one frozen universal second. And then I am back in the winding streets of my childhood. Streets filled with games, Sunday family walks, birthday cakes, bruised knees, and the memory of a day long ago when I said goodbye to this forever. All those days, months, and years, I had tried to recall every stone, every voice, thinking I would never again see them as they used to be. For one fearful moment, I imagine that no one is waiting for me. We are back in the family house. The three golden keys fit the three rusty padlocks. The door slowly squeaks open. My cat rushes in. I open the door wide. I hear my mother's voice. Peter, wash your hands, it's time for dinner. I hear voices in the streets. Everything comes alive. Madeline, let's go wash our hands. Dinner is ready. And it is the end. What an exquisite book. What a beautiful wow. book, yes. Here is another journey. Well, <laughs> there per could perhaps be a journey. In a this journey. Book. Oh yes. <laughs> but we know for sure that there are some odd and maybe spooky noises happening at the Wimbledon's house. And here is a book. Uh, the title is "It's Only Stanley" by John Agee, <laughs> and he is also the illustrator. Hmm. There's a noise at the beginning. Here's sleeping dog. 
Howoo! But the dog there is not making it. <laughs> He's looking at the moon. The Wimbledons were sleeping. It was very, very late when Wilma heard a spooky sound which made her sit up straight. That's very odd, said Walter. I don't recognize the tune. How Oh, it's only Stanley, said Walt Walter said. He's howling at the moon. The Wimbledons were sleeping. It was later than before when Wendy heard a clanking sound below her bedroom floor. That's very odd, said Walter. Then they heard another clank. Clank, clank, clank. It's only Stanley, Walter said. He's fixed the oil tank. <laughs> the Wimbledons were sleeping. It was even later still when Willie smelled a funky smell that made him kind of ill. That's very odd, said Walter, when it's almost half past two. Blub, blub, blub. And here's the cat. Slurp, slurp, slurp. What a mess. It's only Stanley, Walter said. He's making catfish stew. <laughs> the Wimbledons were sleeping. It was late as it can get. When Wanda heard a buzzing noise that made her all upset. That's very odd, said Walter. When it's almost half past three. <laughs> Something very electric. <laughs> <laughs> It's only Stanley, Walter said. He's fixed our old TV. The Wimbledons were sleeping. It was late beyond belief. When Wiley heard a splashy sound that made him say, good grief. That's very odd, said Walter, when we've had so little rain. Splish, splash, sploosh. Mm. It's only Stanley, Walter said. He's cleared the bathtub drain. Now, little Wilma wasn't happy, and the children threw a fit. We'll never get to sleep tonight if Stanley doesn't quit. I understand, said Walter, and I'll talk to him right now. <laughs> but just as Walter turned to go, there was a big kapow. <laughs> the Wimbledons went flying, including Max the cat. Wendy looked around and said, well, what on earth was that? I'll go and look, said Walter, and I'll be back very soon. It's only Stanley, Walter said. We are going to the... Uh-oh. Blast off. <laughs> Bonk. They've landed on the moon. Oh. <laughs> there they are. Oh, Walter has found his true moon love. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. <laughs> Okay, there is another journey story. Oh, this is called Excellent. The Water Princess. It's based on the true childhood experiences of Georgie Badiel. And here it is. This story is written by Susan Verde and illustrated by Peter Re Reynolds. The Water Princess. I am Princess Gigi. My kingdom, the African sky, so wide and so close, I can almost touch the sharp edges of the stars. I can tame the wild dogs with my song. I can make the tall grass sway when I dance. I can make the wind play hide and seek. But I cannot make the water come closer. I cannot make the water run cleaner, no matter what. I command. It is early morning, still dark. My mother wakes me. Gigi, my princess, it's time to get up. We must collect the water. Water, come! Do not make me wake before even the sun is out of bed, I demand. Come, please, I say. But the water won't listen, and I know we will have to go walk so far to the well. 
I am too sleepy to put on my crown. I think of the pot that will rest on my braids instead. The thirst comes quick. Dry lips, dry throat. I squeeze my eyes shut. I see it clear. I dip my toes in. Cool. I scoop it up and bring it to my lips. Slowly, I open my eyes. Nothing. I kick the dust. I grab my empty pot and place it upon my head. My mother does the same and our journey begins, full of song. My mama adds her melody. Our steps are light. We twirl and laugh together. The miles give us room to dance. Halfway there, we stop for a moment at the granite of the giant karite tree, long enough to grab a handful of sweet shea nuts for energy. We can keep the dance going just a little lo longer. Mama, are we there yet? Finally, I hear the water running from the well, the giggles of my friends, the chatter of women. Some have traveled farther than I, only to return home when the sun has gone to bed. Mama holds our place while I play with friends. The dance continues. The water is flowing. Pots filling with the dusty earth-colored liquid. Gigi, come, Matt, no. My turn now. The dance home has slowed to careful steps. My thirst so heavy, like the pot, full pot I carry. Our song is softer now. Our shoulders ache, our feet cramp. I see home at last. Mama boils enough water for drinking. We wait, we wash our clothes, we prepare food for cooking. My father comes quickly from the fields to share in the drink of and the meal. He scoops me up, my princess. You have returned with the water. Drink, Mama says, finally. Every sip fills me with energy. I want to make it last, but I can't. I gulp it down. Clothes and body clean, I sing to the dogs. I dance with the tall grass. I hide from the wind. Mama brings out one last cup she has saved just for me. Drink, my princess. Sleep, my princess. Tomorrow we journey again. Mama, I say as I close my eyes, why is the water so far? Why is the water not clear? Where is our water? Sleep, she says. Dream, she says. Someday you will find a way, my princess. Someday. I am Princess Gigi. My kingdom? The African sky. The dusty earth. And someday the flowing, cool, crystal clear water. Someday. And now here are some pictures of the real life Gigi. These are pe people going to the well to gather water. And it's very dirty and cloudy with silt and, and certainly germs. And here's a smiling girl. And then Gigi earned enough money to build a pump and a well in her own town so that her friends and the people who live in that village no longer have to travel miles and miles and miles all day long to go get the water every day. And this is a true story that really happened in Burkina Faso, Africa. Wow. The end. Wow. Yes. Incredible. We are so lucky. Mm -hmm. Here's a another journey story. <laughs> <laughs> it takes us to the island of Bali, and this is a folk tale, The Dancing Pig by Judy Sierra, illustrated by Jesse Sweetwater. On the island of Bali, in a small house nestled between a dark forest and sunny rice field, a woman lived with her twin daughters, Clodon and Clonching. Every day the girls swept the house and the paths all around it, as they worked, they were careful not to harm any living thing, no matter how small. When Clodon finished sweeping, she would always leave a bit of food on the ground beside a mouse hole, then wait for the little furry creature to nibble it. Creet, creet, creet. 
Just before sunset each day, the twins carry rice holes and water to the family's pig. How lonely you must be, Quan Ching would say, with no one to keep you company. So the girls would dance the Li Gong for her mm -hmm. while frogs made music. First, the tree frogs began, kek, 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 kek. Then the bullfrogs joined in with their low, gong, gong. And all together they sang, kek, kek, gong, gong, kek, kek, gong, gong, kek, <laughs> kek, gong, gong. This made the pig grunt happily, noose, noose, noose. In the forest shadows, someone was hiding and watching. It was the Rangsasa, an ogress who lived beyond the graveyard. The Rangsasa had round eyes to see everything and big ears to hear everything and long sharp fingernails to reach out and grab little ones. She wanted so badly to seize the twin girls as they danced, but she didn't dare as long as their mother was nearby. On boarding, the girl's mother sat down with them. Our money is nearly gone, she said with a sigh. I must go to market and sell nanga seeds. Promise me that while I am away, you will stay inside the house and keep the doors and windows locked in case the Rangsasa should come. Take us with you to the market, the twins begged. It is too far, their mother told them. You must stay here. When I return, I will knock three times and say, Clodan, Klon Ching, it is your mother. Let me in. Only then may you open the door. The Rangsasa watched and listened that day and the next day and the next. Each day the girl's mother arrived home just before sunset. In the afternoon of the fourth day, the ogress herself stepped through the gate and knocked at the door. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Her voice was low and rough. Kludun, Klun Chung, it's your mother, Lut Miut. <laughs> That's not our mother's voice, Glanching cried out. The Rangsasa went back outside the gate. She practiced, making her voice very sweet. Then she knocked on the door again. Talk, talk, talk. Kledin, Klinching, it's your mother. Let me in. <laughs> Go away, shouted Clodon. You are not our mother. The rank Sasa raced home. She cooked up a potion of tang fruit and tuba genu root and, the, and then the scorched bark of a latent gui tree. She lifted the pot to her lips and poured the hot mixture down her throat. Her insides started to itch. Her belly began to burn. She jumped up and down chanting, Clodon clonching, Clodon clonching, until she sounded exactly like the girl's mother. Then she hurried back to the house and knocked at the door, talk, talk, talk. Clodon clonching, it's your mother. Let me in. Mother, the twins cried, at last you're home and they unlocked the door and rushed outside. The Rangsasa grabbed Clodon with her right hand and Klon Ching with her left. Clutching the twins tightly with her fingernails, she carried them to her house. She pushed the two girls into a wooden chest, closed the lid and tied it with a rope. Then she stoked the cooking fire and waited for it to blaze. <sighs> when the twins mother arrived home, she found the house empty. Clodon Clonching, she shouted, where are you? She lit a lantern and ran to all the corners of the compound, frantically calling their names. She was surprised to see the pig standing up on her hind legs. She was even more surprised when the animal spoke to her. The Rangsasa has stolen Clodon and Clonching, said the pig, but if you promise to do everything I say, my friends and I can bring them home safely. I will do anything, said the mother. Take me to your house, said the pig, and dress me in your best sarong and finest jewelry. The mother did as she was told. Mm -hmm. She stretched a sarong around the pig's middle and tied it with a sash. I need two dance fans, the pig told her, and the mother got those as well. She tucked a fresh flower behind each of the animal's ears. Mm -hmm. A mouse appeared, carrying a tiny torch. Then the frogs arrived. One tree frog held a tiny flute and the other a pair of cymbals. A big bullfrog carried a gong, <laughs> while a smaller one toted a drum. <laughs> the mother watched this strange procession march out of the gate of the compound. The mouse led the way, quiet and watchful, and the frogs and the pig tiptoed along behind her. On they walked until they reached a clearing not far from the Rangsasa's house. Then the pig hid behind a tree. 
and the frogs began to play and sing. Kek, kek, kong, kong, kek, kek, kong, kong, kek, kek, kong, kek. The sound soon reached the Rengasa's ears. It charmed her out of her house and down into the clearing. Wah! she exclaimed when she saw the frogs. <laughs> I have lived a long time, but never have I seen such a tiny gamelan orchestra. <laughs> she, was, she was even more surprised when a pig stepped into the torchlight and began to dance the ligong. The pig swayed and turned gracefully flicking her fans to the rhythm of the music, and her eyes flashed left, then right. The ligong is a dance for two, and soon the Rangsasa felt herself pulled along by the frogs playing. The pig handed her a fan, and together they circled and danced. As soon as the Rangsasa began to dance, the mouse scurried inside her house and climbed under the wooden chest. Don't worry, Clodon and Klon Ching, the mouse chirped, and she began to chew the rope. Creep, creep, creep. Now push, said the mouse. Clodon and Klon Ching lifted the lid and stepped out to freedom. Take as much of the Rangsaso's treasure as you can carry, the mouse told the girls. She will not need it anymore. While the twins gathered jewels and gold, the mouse nudged a red hot ember from Rangsaso's cooking fire onto the floor. The twins followed the mouse, their hearts beating quickly. Kikong, kikong, kikong. So afraid that the Rangsasa would see them. But the frog's music held her in its spell. On and on they played and sang, while the pig and the ogress danced the ligong. Suddenly, the Rangsasa smelled smoke. She ran back inside her house, just in time to watch the four walls go up in flames. All around her. <laughs> Glodon and Clonching carried the Rangsasa's treasure to their mother. Never again did she have to sell fruit at the market or leave the twins alone. In the evenings, the three of them always shared their food with the pig and the mouse. While the frogs serenaded them, kek, kek, kong, kong, kek, kek, kong, kong, kek, kek, kong, kek. But the pig never danced again. She was content to watch the twins as she grunted happily. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Oh, what a good story. Perfect timing and ah. what a good story. <laughs> Thank you. Come to the library and you can check these and other books out and talk to us about what you've been reading. Bye-bye. Happy reading.